Hello, everyone. Welcome to Living the Liminal this week. It's Christy Peck here. Um, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad that I get to be here. Um, I just love these little moments where we get to sort of be together and have some enlightened conversation. Even though you're not technically here with me, I, I feel you're here. Um, so I recently... Um, I don't know if you heard last week's episode, but if you have not heard the episode with um, uh, RJ and I around consciousness and what this intuitive intelligence is and spiritual agency, uh, but I would highly recommend going back and listening to last week's episode. It was very enlightening. And so I kind of wanted to just take this a little bit farther um, and kind of delve into some, some more practicality around what that really means. Um, over the weekend, I was I was talking to someone, a, a young adult, and they were sharing with me an experience they were having with their boss. And this was a young woman, and she was sharing with me the experience of she has a boss that's a little bit older than her, a male, she's a female. Um, and she was saying things to me like, you know, when he speaks to me or when he says certain things, it's like he's, he's, I'm in a ball and he's just shoving me smaller and smaller and smaller. And this story, while it kind of um, made me feel like I could really connect with it, because how many times do we have experiences where we feel small and we don't feel seen and we don't feel heard? And we, we kind of lose our sense of self in, in, in a relationship with another person. And what's so interesting is we are a society that allows for marriages to end. We allow for relationships and business to end. We allow for us to leave our jobs. We allow for us to leave our communities, leave a school, go to another school. We allow all those things. We've normalized that aspect of relationships that must end. And yet, the most fundamental relationship that we have, which is the one with our family of origin, okay? And I'm specifically speaking to like the parent-child relationship and or sibling relationships. We won't go there. It is an edge that we do not brave. It is a conversation we will not have. And we go to great lengths to stay in those relationships out of a fog, a fear, an obligation, and a guilt. And that fog ends up becoming filled with smallness and invisibility. And so um, I, I talked about this way, way, way long, long time ago um, in, I forget what, what season it was in, but it was episode, um, I believe it was 48, where I talk about um, making a decision to, to actually end a relationship with my family of origin. And in the, in the, the societal terms, it's called estrangement, right? Um, and when I made that decision, which was not a decision made lightly, it was a decision that kept coming around. So like we think about a spiral and it just kept coming around. And as I look back now, my entire life was setting me up for a decision and a moment where a decision had to be made because that's the essence of like living life is coming into this crossroad moment where you fundamentally have to decide who are you choosing. And so if you go back and listen to episode 48, um, I, I share a lot about that. I share about what I really, the aha I was having about, wow, we really can choose ourselves. We really can choose outside of conditioning and wounds and programming and we can choose outside of that fear, obligation, and guilt. And so, um, so I come today 
in, in a totally different place with this conversation. And so as this young person was sharing this story, I really could just resonate. And it kind of started me down this thinking that, and of course it has to do with thinking, right? That we are not taught in our world about the different availabilities we have of, of, of a choice in terms of like how you think. So how you think, like I think about that as like kind of like a mindset, right? So it's a, a mindset is like a construct of thoughts and beliefs and maybe even ideas and, um, and, and they serve as this like foundational formula and for why you do what you do and why you don't do what you need to do maybe or why you don't want to do something. So this, this formula serves then as kind of like a file for you and you, you pull from it. Well, when our mindset is a little shattered and a little messy and maybe even dirty, okay, it's got to be cleared out. And so one of the things I realized when I actually um, participated in this estrangement from my family of origin and really began to look in the mirror to myself and uncover things about myself and dig into the inner world that I was really disassociated with and disconnected with, I, I began to understand that there was something that I had never um, allowed to evolve within me. And that was a freedom mindset. And like, we're born with free will. It's just part of like, think of even a baby. A baby decides if their arm is going to go to something to grab, on, to grab onto it. Um, even as an infant, the infant decides if it's going to crawl around. So, so as, as beings, we are born with this freedom, but we don't cultivate and, and evolve a freedom mindset. And we have other kinds of mindsets. I mean, a lot of people talk about the success mindset, right? And that's the, the whole idea of achieving. Like, how, what is your mind? How are you disciplining your mind for achievement? Um, we talk about the abundance mindset and how are you evolving your mind and disciplining your mind for receiving. Well, a freedom mindset is all about how are you disciplining, okay? And I don't mean controlling in terms of disciplining. I just mean, are you creating the right space, the right environment, the right experience for you to be able to re relieve the hold? Okay, so whatever that is. A freedom mindset is, is the opportunity always to, to access your free will because you have a divine free will. And so um, I kind of think of there are kind of three different um, aspects to this freedom mindset. And the first is building self-awareness, right? And like, for instance, you have to kind of notice your thoughts. You have to pay attention to, to noticing your thoughts, noticing the sensation around the thought that takes place in your body, okay? Or maybe noticing the sensation to act outwardly when that thought comes. So you have to kind of witness some of what is going on. And then, and then there's this other aspect of building self-awareness, which is owning it, like name it, say it out, because then it loses its power within you to hold you in place and to grip you in a stronghold that you can't move from. And so it's, it's sort of like um, deactivating the power of the thought that anchors you in certain actions and behaviors that then result in unfavorable emotions. So if we can fe to feel a sense of freedom, okay, there, you know, we would want to awaken within ourselves um, using things like grief as a springboard to, um, 
to thrusting something new and unimaginable. So a lot of times when it, within this freedom mindset, you don't even realize that if you just own the emotion, own the thoughts around the emotion, name it, speak energy into it. Because once you do, it allows space for that grief to actually be a creative force. And, um, and then there's this other concept that takes place within this freedom that a mighty death takes place within. So it's like life is brought about through the death of something. It's like a symbolic nature of letting go because in order to access your divine free will, there has to be a death of the ongoing ego narrative that keeps you thinking that thought and emoting that emotion and choosing those actions and behaviors that are limiting you. So there's this, you know, being, it's sort of like moving beyond this basic sensory perception into your wiser self. And within that wiser self, you have moments of like awe and wonder. Like you start to experience like, whoa, there's a whole new world here. There's a bigger world out here. There's way more going on here. You then start to cultivate and access inspiration where you literally feel this fire in your belly just start to rise. You start to, to have more agency around knowing, like you just know something. You just, you just, you just like go, wow, I know something. I believe this to be true. And you, you then be a, you then can connect that with all the other people and experiences around you from a true place of freedom. And that allows you to have that compassion for another human being or another experience. And so this freedom mindset by way of building self-awareness then allows you to, nothing pushes away. You don't push anything away. You, you welcome and you invite in the thoughts, the emotions, even the actions, you watch yourself, you watch from a place of being a witness to an observer of how you are acting and behaving in moments. Um, and it's interesting then because this young adult and I were having this conversation around this very concept that, okay, well, what within you, what kinds of thinking within you need to kind of die off? And then there's this certain sense of grieving those thoughts and beliefs that you've held on to forever in order to access what, how do you really believe and think in these moments? And, and it's always interesting because when we sit with this, okay, the idea of building self-awareness is a little bit of a pause where you just kind of start to watch and observe and you start to take notice. And within the silent invitation the whole self can become alive, wise, and awakened. And this is truly the freedom mindset to be all of who you are. Now, the other aspect, okay, of a freedom mindset is then you have to cultivate this wholeness, right? So like, think about an image of something being whole. And I'm going to use this like um, image of like, okay, a string. So if you have a string, you cut off a piece of string from like this whole bundle of string, right? So something then is cut off and it, and this string, it might be like a line, which means that it's a part of something. It has, it has the beginning and the end, but it's, there's, there's gaps, right? On either end, there's gaps. Well, if you take a string and you actually take the string and create a circle by way of putting these two ends where there are gaps, closing that gap, right? Then the edges touch. And when the edges touch, you actually have wholeness. So, so how do we cultivate this wholeness then? Once we are self-aware and once we build awareness into some of these things, the freedom mindset allows you then to start cultivating the sense. So you're strengthening. You're strengthening what already is there. You were never broken. You've always been whole. 
So you start to cultivate in this moment, in this experience, in these relationships, even in the, the, the formulation of what you thought was the way you believed and what you should be doing and what you have to be doing, you start to cultivate a different sense about, I don't think that was ever really mine. I don't think that's the way I really believe. And it begins with a choice. And you, you start to give yourself permission to choose the wiser, right? So you see, by way of awareness, you see the separation and the connection. You see fixing and allowing the imperfection. We're not pushing anything away, but we are choosing the wiser because it begins to start to feel good. And we move from something is always wrong here. I have to fix this or everything is right here and everything will be okay here. And I am okay in the space. And you start to then, when you realize that everything begins with a choice, right? You start to oscillate between feeling a sense of grounding, right? Which is being anchored into something connected to a sense of movement, which is sort of a little bit of a disconnection to, not to, to, to the wholeness, a disconnection to the experience and to maybe even the person that you're in relationship with. And this allows you to bring peace and harmony into your body. So this oscillating between grounding and movement and grounding and movement, and it becomes like a harmonized dance that you begin to kind of just pay attention to, right? Keep that self-awareness flowing in and you begin to pay attention to it. And within that flow of in and out, grounding and movement and grounding and movement, you destabilize the entanglement that you had to a conditioning that didn't allow you to have the freedom mindset and the traps that you, that you felt you were prisoner to that didn't allow you to have this freedom mindset. And you start to get curious and say, what is keeping me here, right? Anchored into something. Um, it's, it's like the emotional, the emotion then becomes like the overlay for the transformation and allowing yourself to just destabilize a little bit. So it's sort of like, yeah, you're going to get a little uncomfortable at times. That's what transformation does. It takes you into the uncomfortable in order to take you back into the comfortable. And if you think about it, uh, years and years ago, I worked out with a trainer and, and whenever we finished our session, I, my muscles were so sore. I could barely walk. I was exhausted. My body hurt. And then like within a day or two, you felt stronger. So that's what I mean by you're destabilizing the entanglement and the traps that you've been in. That's the conditioning and the programming. And you are then rediscovering that within this transformation, you then oscillate between grounding and movement. So it allows you to, oh my gosh, this is evolution. You are then beginning to grow into the self you've always been. And that is how you cultivate wholeness. And then as you cultivate wholeness, you're able to then experience the third aspect, which is transcending the feedback system. So you lift the conditioning up, right? You start to notice it. We're not pushing away. We're not getting rid of, we're not, we're not judging it. We're just kind of lifting it up just enough so we can build some curiosity. Think about, um, okay, a long, long time ago, we were staying in this hotel and we were picking my older children up from this uh, camp. And we had to stay in this hotel that was kind of grungy and gritty. Um, and one time my, one of my other kids came and they were like, mom, we don't even know if there's like a bed bug in there or something. And we were all laughing. It was clean. It just, it just was old. Right. So, so like they would take the comforter on the bed and they would like lift it up and look underneath. Right. And so that's the idea of lifting the conditioning just so you can get some curiosity and you build a more curious state. So that you build in questions and asking and you build in, I'm wondering here and what does this mean and what does this 
what does this entail? And I wonder why this is happening. And you start to do that. And as you build that curiosity, okay, because you're lifting the conditioning, you then widen the lens. So what that means to widen the lens is there's always more going on than what you understand because you're moving beyond the perceptual state that you're used to of just your basic senses. And you're moving into things like instinct and inspiration, curiosity, um, a connection to a higher self, a connection to the spiritual world that is inviting in loved ones and ancestral um, um, generational loved ones that have gone on before, a spirit world of all kinds of spirits that are in that, in that across the veil. And you're and so you're widening the lens to what does this mean? Is not that there's only one aspect, one response, one answer. It now offers a lot more availability to what something can mean and a lot of layers to what something can mean. And you, um, I want you to like imagine. So I do this kind of with my clients. Imagine you're standing in a room where it's all white and you have white walls, four white walls. And as you stand in front of a white wall, imagine a projector screen is projecting out like kind of like a, a, a play, right? Or a show, like you're watching something on TV. And so when, when it, what it means to widen the lens, it means take a look at one aspect of that wall and what's being projected. Okay, that's one option. And then you turn and you look at another wall and there's another scenario and that's another feedback. And then you turn and look at another one and that's another option. And then you turn and look at the fourth wall and there's another scene being projected onto that wall and that's another option. And so within, when you widen the lens, it means that when we've been so conditioned in our earlier years, those early imprints, we tend to believe that, that there's only one answer. There's only one solution. There's only one thought here. There's only one thing we're experiencing here. And when you widen the lens, you begin to realize there's a lot more going on than I ever realized here because you have all these availabilities of options here to choose from. And so when you transcend the feedback system, you're moving from a closed feedback system to an open feedback system where you're saying, hey, wait, there's not just one thing going on here. It doesn't just mean this. It may be this experience means three and four other things as well, because there's always more going on than you know. And so there's not just only one right, right, right way to do something, one right choice. There's a lot more going on there, a lot more availability. And so what ends up happening is then you can give yourself permission, right? Because you've broadened out, you've widened this lens and you can then give yourself permission that permission comes from within. It doesn't come from without. It doesn't come from the external environment. It doesn't come from the, the, the parents that you had or the teachers or the leadership or the government. Permission always comes from within because you have this divine free will. That's what a freedom mindset does is it allows you to start to operate from, oh my gosh, I can give myself permission here. And, and what do I want? And, and what works for me? And so in every moment, you then can test that reality. And the, even the word reality has real in it. So what you're doing is you're testing, is this real or not? Is this real or not? And see, so you've widened the lens. So you transcend the feedback system from a conditioning to an openness, an abundance of availability to what things mean and what they could mean and what really is going on here. And then you get to say, is this real? How do I know it's real? And what does it say about me? because it's always going to come back to, what does this say about me? You know, what does this say? Does, does this say that I believe I'm whole or does this say that I believe I'm broken? Does this say that I have my own agency to choose for myself or, or does this say that I have to have permission from everyone else before I can choose something? Or does this say that I only believe there's only one right way, one right, right choice here and I believe there's nothing else available? And so 
part of what I had to do when I made that decision to estrange from my family of origin is I had to take a really hard, long look at what was really happening here. And this allowing these aspects of this freedom mindset really allowed me a formula for moving through, like a system for moving through determining and discerning what was mine and what was not mine. And um, uh, Jung talks about the change of character brought about by the uprush of collective forces is amazing. So when I started to allow the entanglement process of kind of like, a, like if you think of lights at Christmas time and they're all tangled up and nasty and you're having to go through and figure out what strand of lights belongs to what strand of lights, it can feel a little claustrophobic and it can feel like there are these forces that are just kind of blowing up inside of you. And yet it allowed for the change that needed to take place, which was some of what I was believing, some of the way I was acting, they were not mine. They were just conditioned responses, conditioned beliefs. And when I really start to, when I started to allow myself to work through these aspects of a freedom mindset, I was given this availability of, wow, this is what it means. So if you think about my example earlier, where you had the, the string and then you, you put the edges together, right? And it became a circle. The circle is really a symbolic representation of wholeness. And it's like the coming together of parts. So to develop a freedom mindset means that you are coming together in wholeness and by way of taking a look at the different parts that you are and putting those parts back together, not because you were broken, but because you didn't recognize them. You, free, you, you didn't give yourself permission to freely see all this beautiful parts of you that were always, always there. They haven't gone anywhere. You just are now starting to, to see them. And this is, the circle is a representation of the journey. And some might call it like the hero's journey or the heroine's journey, but it's sort of like recognizing for the first time what fires you up what lights you up, what gets you so excited, what, what just gets you so inspired. Um, and we all have different journeys. Um, the trajectory of our lives is about recoding that earlier imprint, right? And coming into this free space and establishing freedom as a mindset, not, not an action, but a mindset that then inspires and motivates and influences and impacts how you feel, how you think, how you act and behave in the life you are living. Um, and the tool for you to navigate like this estrangement and, and you know, like I'm talking a little bit about like estranging from the family of origin, but it's really about any relationship you're in where you feel an inner conflict. So again, this the story of this young, young woman that I was speaking to about her boss. I mean, that is a crossroads. It's a crossroad moment for her to decide, okay, to, to navigate that experience using the freedom mindset, because it allows for you to broaden and see and cultivate wholeness and choose, choose from a wiser self, not the one who's feeling small and bundled up. Um, Carl Jung also said that we are constantly living on the edge of a volcano. And that is because every relationship is holy, meaning that it is either going to bring you more into consciousness or it is going to create an inner conflict for then that inner conflict to sort of like a volcano, it keep exploding so that you bring yourself back into consciousness. So it is either one is going to be a flow that brings you into consciousness, or the other one is going to be a little disruption that's going to then land you into consciousness. So again, it's like 
you know, so often in our society, we sort of normalize this, this uh, reactionary outburst because we're just so used to people reacting and reacting. And we were used to us jumping through hoops to, to control and to govern the reaction. And, and, and really the freedom mindset is about peace and harmony and flow. It is about sitting back and it is about knowing and operating from a wiser part of ourselves that often doesn't really get invited to the table for dinner, okay? And yet we need to invite it more often to just come in to these experiences and play a part and become less reactionary so that we can really instead of cutting ourselves off from the emotional depth that we have within us, we can then operate from this sense of wholeness. And, um, you know, right around the time that I made the decision to, to estrange from my family of origin, I started to begin, my first level of building that self-awareness was around noticing the roles that I played. You know, I was playing the good daughter. I was playing the supportive family member. I was playing the helper. I was playing the caretaker. And yet there was always a little bit of discomfort in those roles because I was finding myself almost unrecognizable at times because I would be pissed off and I would be frustrated. And I would be like, oh God, here we go again. Here we go again. Here we go again. And and it was like pulling back those layers so that I could understand, wow, I have a choice here. I don't even have to play these roles if I don't want to. Like, I don't have to be the good daughter because what does that mean? The good girl? That means that then there's a bad girl. And if I'm making a decision that is best for me, and is, is best for what I, you know, how I want to be and who I think I am and what's best for me and what I want. Is that good? And is that bad? It's only good and bad as it relates to other people. And, and I didn't, I started to recognize that I was always living in this duality of even for myself, this is good. This is not good. This is what I should be doing. This is what I should not be doing. And I was not giving myself permission to really even test my reality out and ask myself those questions of, oh my gosh, what do I want this? How do I know I want this? Does this even feel good for me? And the interesting thing is in this, in this process, this journey, right? We're, we're always in this journey of self-discovery. In this journey, because when I separated from my family of origin, I had to come to realize that there's also this oneness that's going on that you're always connected. So, you know, in the very beginning, yeah, I was wanting to push things away. I was really trying to get all the yuck and the ick and the, oh my gosh, I don't want to live like this anymore. And this is heavy and this feels thick and it feels dense. And this is not what I want anymore. And as I pushed it away, and then I started to breathe again, and I was able to see that always available to you is this abundance of space and this abundance of air and this abundance of choice. And it allowed me then to sit back in this freedom mindset and to start to see things differently. And I remember there was a moment that I had where I was thinking about my mother and the behaviors that had constantly gone on that were not really nurturing. They weren't nourishing. They were serving her. They were not necessarily serving me. Um, The narratives, the actions that I used to just constantly say to myself, why is she doing that to me? Why, why is she, why is she acting like that? 
and, and I'm going to be honest with you. There was a lot of entangling that, um, I'm not good enough. I don't belong here. Um, I don't like myself. I don't think anyone really likes me because I don't think they know me. Um, why are they saying those things about me? Um, and there was this one day that I, I remember thinking about those behaviors and, and then imagining that my mother was standing right in front of me. And I thought, if I don't like her, what does that say about me? Because in relationships, we mirror each other. So I can't have a relationship where I like me, but I hate you. Because what does that say about me? Because what that really means is there's a part of me I don't like. If I don't like you, there's a part of me I don't like. And what I have come to realize is that was when I really accepted compassion. I could separate out. I'm not leaving the family of origin in the essence of consciousness because we are all connected. And I infinitely can feel that we are all connected. I have immense love for my family of origin more than I can probably even put word, words to. And yet I can accept the physical separation from the physical human being, from the spiritual connection we have as a consciousness. So when we ask that very, we give ourselves permission to test the reality and to ask those choice-filled, curious questions of, what does this say about me? If I'm holding on to this thought, what does that say about me? If I'm holding on to this emotion, what does that say about me? If I'm holding on to this certain action, what does that say about me? And when we really can push ourselves to the edge of that, we can strengthen something so beautiful within us. Um, Renee Brown wrote a book recently called The Atlas of the Heart. And there was this part in there, and I think she even did it on her HBO special. So if you haven't seen that, you might wanna go watch that. But she talks about that the feeling of joy and overwhelm have the same sensation in our bodies. And I remember when she was saying that, because it's like, well, what if we drew ourselves closer to those initial experiences and that we feel sort of define our emotional agency. And what if we got closer and really asked the question, like, what if I got that imprint wrong? What if I registered that imprint incorrectly and inauthentically? Because I made that imprint, right, that early experience, so like, for instance, my earlier experiences with my mother, my father, my family of origin, I registered those imprints inaccurately because I registered them as there was something wrong with me and something right with them. And I got that in correctly because what if there was something right about all of us? What if everything was right about all of us? See, that's what's available within the freedom mindset is that you get to ask that lengthy, abundant kind of a question. What if everything was right? What if everything turned out in the way that it was supposed to turn out? And when we make early experiences about us, meaning we don't feel whole, we feel broken. We don't feel good enough. We feel like there's, we're lacking. When we create scarcity around who we are, we, we can't access, we can't get close to the edge of freedom because we are constantly living in limitation. Um, I remember 
what's so interesting, see, again, the spiral. So experiences will keep coming around to you until you begin to understand them deeply. And so when I was younger, um, my full name is Christine, spelled with a K and an I-N-E. And so all in my earlier years and, you know, young adult years, um, the family ex- spelled my name with a Y. So K-R-I-S-T-Y. Well, when I got to college and, you know, I'm out on my own, right? Professors would be like, they would spell my name with an I. And I just kind of got a little tired of saying it's with a Y, it's with a Y. And to be honest, it was my first permission to choose for myself. I was like, I don't even freaking like spelling it with a Y. Like it's, it just doesn't even work for me because my name is Christine I and E. So it would make sense to just drop the N E and keep the I. So I just kind of let it be spelled that way. And I started writing it that way. Christy with an I, Christy with an I. And to be honest, a lot of people spelled my name wrong. They spelled it C-H, they spelled it with a Y. I didn't really ever care because it wasn't really who I was. It's just the name. And it, it was so interesting because my, son, my older son has a nickname and his nickname is spelled with just two letters. Well, when he was in kindergarten, the teacher called and she's like, Christy, are you sure? You know, you told me that this was his name and this was how he was going to be called but then he's wanting to use this other name. And so I started laughing. I said, well, let me talk to him and let me see. So we've talked to him that night. I was like, well, sweet. Why are you going, like, why are you spelling? And what he was doing was using his full name. And he was like, mom, they're making a chart with our names. I don't want to be at the bottom of that chart with two letters. I want to be up in the middle with five letters. Well, that just made me laugh because I was like, well, okay, you get to choose. It's your name, not mine. And so again, like in that little moment, he was given this freedom, this permission to cultivate who he was, that wholeness, and to choose for himself who he wanted, how he wanted to be called and his name. And to this day, there are pockets of people that call him by his full name or call him by his nickname. It is hilarious. And I remember that one of the behaviors that happened when I made the decision to estrange from my family of origin is that another family member, that was the projection was. And who do you think you are changing your name beyond the name you were given by your parents? And, and so what I'm, I'm sharing this story with you because it shows that Sometimes in our conditioning and those imprints, those early imprints with our family of origin, we get programmed to not have freedom. We get programmed to be a people pleaser and jump through hoops hoops to, to allow for others to have freedom, but not us. And so when we can cultivate and to exercise a discipline of a freedom mindset, we then can operate from a very secure, aligned place, right? Aligning our thoughts and our beliefs with our authentic self. And within that authentic self, we get to choose by way of our true self what's best. So a couple questions I want to kind of offer you. And that is, you know, when you're sitting in these experiences and Again, whether you are someone who has estranged from your family of origin, whether you just have some inner conflict around anyone within your family of origin, whether you're just in a relationship right now that kind of just brings about some some inner conflict for you, you know, asking, getting closer to the edge and getting closer to what really is going on is building, remember, lifting the conditioning so that you can build a more curious state. And within that, Asking questions like, is this an expression from me? Like, is this a real expression from me? Or is this an expression for me? Meaning, again, something that needs to be untangled so that you get closer to consciousness. Do I need to let go of this expression as it is not mine to own anymore? There were many, many moments I had to be like, 
this is not even my thought. This is not even how I believe. This is not even how I feel. And I could watch myself. I had to, I had to kind of like release and let those things go. So again, like taking a look at your everyday life, taking a look at your experiences, taking a look at your relationship, taking a look at how you show up, how you present yourself. Okay. What persona are you creating and asking yourself, does this nourish me? Is this nurturing for me? Does this feel good? And if it does, can I increase this to get more of this? Because again, the freedom mindset allows you to choose by your own divine free will, how you want to be and what you want to be. Um, and then from those questions, then we're able to really sit and take inspired action, which is aligning to our, authentic, our own authenticity and then taking action from that place of authenticity, not from a place of the conditioning, not from the place of this is what the family expects of me, not from a place of this is what society and my culture expects from me, but truly from a place of this is true for me. And this is my truth. And in this moment of asking yourself, is this an expression of me? Is this an expression for me to work through, right? Is a pivotal intersection, it's a crossroad and it's available within every experience, within every decision, within every relationship. It's a pivotal intersection where you get to ask the most monumental freeing questions ever. Who am I? And who do I want to be? And you get to decide, is this who I am? Is this who I want to be? And by way of just constantly asking ourselves that question, see, it's a, it's a, it's a continual flow of, of cultivating that curiosity and that line of questioning building the awareness around. That's what the freedom mindset is all about. Because what happens is we're so afraid to erupt the perceived um, comfort that we've created for ourselves by way of, oh, here's the persona. I have to be this, or I have to be this, or I have to be this. And we're so afraid of erupting that. See, we're always on the edge of a volcano. That when we really allow ourselves to get honest and truthful, we aren't really comfortable. We think, see, it's the ego narrative that has created this false illusion around comfort, but really, and our ego really loves to to create these fantastical stories for us to kind of just get all wound up in, right? Like a volcano, um, it's, that's the collective force of the ego to just kind of create the drama and the chaos around it. But when we really get truthful, we're not comfortable. When we really get truthful, we have this perceived deception that if we choose ourselves, we betray the world. And in a freedom mindset, we choose ourselves to never betray ourselves. And we are equally afraid of the power of our own voice and our own agency of ourselves to choose as we are in that perceived power of tightening the lid and playing small. And by braving the edge, we have to get closer to why we really choose the things that we choose. Because living fully alive is about strengthening the duality of feeling good and not feeling good, paying attention to, building that awareness how are these thoughts affecting my body? And can I own that? Not pushing it away, just sort of owning that. And then in that owning, we can then cultivate the wholeness that we really are and transcend our feedback system so that we are giving ourselves permission to fully choose, fully choose our comfort and our discomfort. And so I'm going to leave you with just this one thought. Okay, I want you this week to pay attention to maybe a relationship you're standing in front of. 
maybe an experience that you go to, maybe it's a job that you're having. And I want you to ask, is this the way I want to fail? And I want you just to be really fucking clear about the answer. And I want you to, if the answer is no, then change it. Be brave enough to change it. If the answer is, I don't know, I don't think I can change it, creatively change it. Get yourself into that freedom mindset and creatively change it. Even a little bit goes a long way. And a little bit more each day goes a long way. And if you still think you can't change it, change it anyway. You go ask for help. We give a lot of resources on my website. We give a lot of resources. There's a lot of resources out there. You go get help so that you can change the way you feel. Because if you are asking this question, is this the way I want to feel? And your answer is no, and you're not doing anything about it. Sweetheart, you are locked in a prison and you are betraying yourself over and over and over and over again. If you ask that question, is this the way I want to feel? And your answer is no, and you make a choice, even the tiniest little bit of choice, your, your entire world will begin to unfold in ways you could never have imagined. Back in February of 2020, closer to those, that time, that day in the coffee shop when I made that decision to estrange from my family of origin, I had been asking myself that question. Is this the way I want to feel? Is this the way I want to feel when I'm standing in someone who standing in front of other people that are to that are are in that that societal narrative of family? And my answer was no, I don't want to feel this way. I asked that question over and over again at family functions. I asked that question at other functions. I asked that question when text messages would come in. I asked that question when emails would come in. I asked that question when, when I was bypassed and, and uh, those in my family went to my kids. I asked that question, is this the way I want to feel? And the answer every single time was no. The hardest part of that decision was moving beyond the perceptual foundation that, well, this is your family. And I'm here to tell you there's more going on there than you even know. So please, this week, ask yourself, is this the way I want to feel? Cultivate a freedom mindset to be able to face the answer to that question. And by all means, if you don't think you can change it, get help. Because I'm here to tell you that you are worthy. You are so worthy. You are so beautiful. You can brave the edge. There's a lot of resources out there to help you brave the edge. Okay, that's all I got today. I love you. Peace out, my friends.